Chapter 1. Productivity is not about getting more things done. 21st century workers are the most distracted in history. Study after study show that people are hardly committed to work for the entire eight hours they stay in the office. One study of UK and Canadian workers reports that employees work an average of one and a half to two and a half hours out of the eight they are supposed to be working. The numbers are indeed staggering, and it's not only true for employees. Business owners and self-employed people also struggle to stay productive. It's not even that we're disengaged with work. Work. A good number of us love the work we do. We're passionate and proficient, just too distracted by emails, phone calls, Slack messages, data feeds, and the likes. We try to get around this productivity problem by googling tips and hacks and investing in productivity solutions. These tactics help, except they aren't sustainable. If you're honest, you'll probably admit to trying several productivity hacks that don't work. Michael Hyatt was in your shoes several years ago. After he rose to the position of CEO at Thomas Nelson, Michael found that he was splitting himself between too many tasks. He was doing so many different things in a day that he almost always ended up drained and exhausted after work. He tried productivity apps and tricks, but they didn't help much. This made him start studying the subject of productivity for himself. He created a blog where he shared ideas he got along the way with his readers. Soon, he was being known more as a productivity expert than the CEO of a company. Focusing on everything means focusing on nothing. Michael Hyatt Michael distilled his years of learning and personal experience into a three-step productivity system, and that's what we're about to learn in this summary. The first step is to stop and decide what you want, then create an action plan. Step two is cutting out unnecessary work and focusing on work that inspires you. Finally, step three is where you take action. If you're down on productivity, the solution is not to work more, but to pull back and re-strategize. Don't worry, we will go through all, all steps in this summary, but first, a disclaimer. This summary may rubbish everything you think you know about being productive. Get ready for it. Did you know? Research shows we get interrupted or distracted every three minutes on average. Chapter 2 The secret to, to winning the productivity game is to have a clear vision for your work life. There is an old statement that is often referenced by some productivity experts and work-life balance advocates. The statement was made popular by American rabbi Harold, Harold Kushner, and it's often attributed to former U.S. Senator Paul Tsongas. You've heard it before. It says, nobody on his deathbed ever said, I wish I had spent more time at the office. That statement may be true for some people, but you can't just generalize it. Work constitutes a major part of our lives. Yes, some people go to work just because they have to pay the bills, but some others are excited about work. They're happy when they get up in the morning because a new day is another chance for them to make a dent in the universe through, this, through their work. This category of people don't regret spending time at work. And no, they don't have to be Steve Jobs or Elon Musk or another famous inventor slash creator. They are salespeople, writers, lawyers, accountants, etc., who are happy with the work they do. They cherish their profession because it's a vehicle for helping someone achieve something. The difference between these people and those who hate their jobs is the difference between productivity on an inspiring job and fake work on a job you dislike. A good chunk of emplo employees are disengaged with work, but this shouldn't be so. You're wasting your time, and by extension, your employer's time, working on a job you don't like. You may be on a job you hate because circumstances have you there, maybe because it pays the bills, but let that be a temporary arrangement. Create an exit plan and start working on it as soon as possible. Your time on earth is limited. Don't spend it working on a job you dislike. What if you're doing work you like, but it's encroaching into your nights and weekends? You may need to create a prevention system around it if your goal isn't to work long hours every week. Start by creating a vision of your ideal work week. How many hours would you like to spend on work? How will you spend your ideal 24 hours? How many of it will go for self-time, family time, recreation, work, and play? How about your weekends? Create this ideal timeline and keep it where you can see it. You may not have the resources to make it happen now, but let it become something you're working towards. Chapter 3. There are four different zones of work. Contrary to what many people think, productivity is not all about doing more. In fact, it's the opposite. True productivity means getting the right things done and leaving everything else. This may sound hard to believe, but as we proceed with this summary, you will understand more and realize just how true it is. Let's consider the four zones of productivity. It will give you better insight. We will begin with the zone we all hate. Zone Phone 4. This is called the drudgery zone. 
This zone is made up of tasks that you hate doing and can't do well. In other words, you lack the passion and proficiency for these tasks. Can you name some daily tasks in your drudgery zone? If you think hard, you probably will. The good news is, what's grunt work for you is exciting work for someone else. That's why division of labor works. Zone 3. The disinterest zone. Tasks in this zone are things you're good at but have zero passion for. Many people people get stuck working in this zone simply because it pays the bills. Zone 2. The distraction zone. Work starts to get interesting here. In this zone, you're passionate about your work. You can do it all day without getting tired, but you're not skilled at it. Because you lack proficiency, it, beco it becomes hard to make worthy contributions through your work. But of course, if you're in this zone, you can spend money and time to get more skills so you can transition to zone 1, the best zone of all. Zone 1. The desire zone. This is, this is the zone where passion meets proficiency. People who work here love what they do and are able to make notable contributions to their company, their industry, and the world at large. If you design your life so that you spend most of your time working on things you are passionate about and proficient at, the discipline to do those things comes easily. Michael Hyatt Your goal should be to work in the desire zone. Of course, for most of us, that will take some time and effort, but give it a go. Maybe you're working on a job you're skilled at but not passionate about. You could start thinking of changing jobs or switching tasks within the company so you get into the role where your passion and proficiency are top-notch. Design your ideal life, then tailor your work to meet that lifestyle goal. The time and effort required to transition to Zone 1 will differ depending on where you are right now. But no matter what it takes, the transition will be worth it. Chapter 4. Be intentional about re-energizing your mind and body. When you're on the clock, you, you understand how time is such a limited resource. We all know that, but what we often fail to realize is that energy is also limited. Your energy can flex. That is, you can switch between energy levels quite easily, but it's still a limited resource. You don't have infinite amounts of emotional, mental, and physical energy, so taking steps to conserve what you have is a wise thing to do. Are you intentional about conserving and renewing your energy, or do you just take whatever you see because there is no time? In a distracted economy, people run around getting things done on the clock, failing to rest and re-energize. Then, they burn out and take sick leave, only to repeat the same vicious cycle over again. This explains why our productivity rarely matches the hours we clock in. Don't sacrifice your body and mind on the altar of work because it will turn back to haunt you. What if you created a holistic system that ensures you work when you need to work and unplug to re-energize when you need to? What would that mean? that mean for your personal and professional life? Surely, among other things, it will mean getting quality work done for the time plugged in and having more personal time. Isn't that what we all, we all want? Well, here's how to achieve it. Get intentional about the following seven practices. Get quality sleep every night. Experts recommend sleeping eight hours per night. Try not to fall short of that. Eat healthily. If you need to see a dietitian for recommendations, do it. Move your body. Create a weekly exercise reg regimen and stick to it. Connect with family and friends daily and weekly. Play. Engage regularly in your hobbies. Don't push them to the back burner. Reflect daily. You can do this through meditation, writing, or worshiping. Unplug. Life is not all about work. Find time at least once a year to just unplug from work and enjoy life. Chapter 5. Practice saying no. We have an inherent desire to help others and contribute to, to important projects. This can be both a curse and a blessing, depending on how we use it. People will come to you directly or indirectly for help, and if you're not careful, you will keep saying yes till you fill your hands with too much than you can handle. You must learn to say no. It's not up for debate if your goal is to be a super performer who excels in every area of life. Not every request deserves your yes. Did you cringe at the thought of turning down requests? That's a completely normal reaction from your mind. You might even feel guilty for saying no to people. And that's a natural feeling too. But you must grow past it. Because we're always saying no without realizing it. For every yes you say, there is a no behind it. For every request you accept, you're turning down another. Let's imagine a potential client asks you out for lunch on the same day you're supposed to be at your daughter's dancing competition. Saying yes to the client means saying no to attending your daughter's event. Always consider the trade-off before accepting invitations and, re and requests. Use this affirmation strategy for turning down requests you can't afford to accept. First, say yes to yourself and everything important to you. 
Also, affirm the other person so they don't feel shame for requesting. Second, say no to the request. Make it clear that you can't do it now or any other time. Third, say yes again. Not yes to the request, but yes to your relationship. Affirm your relationship with the person and offer to help find a solution or someone else that could help. Let's say, let's say someone asked you to watch over their kids for a day, but you can't because despite working remotely, you have a tight deadline to meet that day. Using our model, you start by saying yes to yourself and the work you do. That's the only way to get the mental stamina to say no to them. Next, turn down the request by telling them about your tight deadline. And finally, you can offer to help find a babysitter. Chapter 6. Automate Your Activities Your days are filled with attention pulling requests from work, the internet, family, friends, and even strangers. You will never get anything done if you decide to pay attention to everything, and some of those things are important and urgent such that you can't afford to postpone them. So what do you do? Find ways to automate. In this chapter, we will consider four automation methods you should use to make your life easier. Let's get started. Self-automation. The mind is a powerful automation tool. Some of the most effective automation machines were created by replicating how it works. Once you do something in a particular way over some time, your mind learns it and you begin to do it with little to no active thoughts. For example, if you've been using an app on your phone for a considerable length of time, your mind will teach your body to identify the position of that app on your phone. The process of finding that app will become automated. The same explanation goes for your morning routine. The reason you do the same things after getting out of bed every morning is that your mind has learned how to do it and has taught your body. The mind learns through routine routines, so to automate things, start building routines around your activities. Template Automation Every knowledge work you do can be automated using temp and template template templates. Either create templates that suit your workflow or Google to find useful ones. For example, if you're sending the same type of emails daily, you could make that into a template so you don't have to type out every email. It saves you time. Process Automation this refers to detailing the process of getting things done so you or someone on your, on your team won't have to waste precious hours figuring things out each time they have to get the same task done. Tech Automation This is by far the most common automation people know. There is at least one software that can help you do your office work faster. Invest in software products to save time and energy. The secret of succeeding with tech automation is refusing to stick to just one solution. Be flexible enough to change when your current solution no longer serves your needs. Chapter 7. High performers use mega batching to stay productive. You've probably heard of batching before. If you haven't, it's a productivity tactic where you lump the same or similar activities and get them done at the same time with no distractions. Mega batching is doing the same thing on a larger scale. You can think of this tactic as a solution to multitasking. Contrary to what we think, the brain isn't designed to multitask. You get much more done when you're focused on one activity per time than when you try doing multiple things at a time. When you jump from one activity to the other in a multitasking spree, the brain takes time to reconcile the new activity with the one you were doing before. Parts of the brain will therefore be split between both activities, and it becomes counterproductive if the tasks aren't similar. Use mega batching instead. Regularly decide on a group of activities that are the same or at least similar and block out time to execute them together. Let's say meetings are a normal part of your week. Rather than spreading your, in your internal and external meetings throughout the week, you can decide on a day or two that will be dedicated to meetings while other days will be for something else. For example, Thursdays and Fridays can be your meeting days while the first three workdays will be dedicated to working. In a world where information is freely available, focus becomes one of the most valuable commodities in the workplace. Michael Hyatt We live our lives in stages, taking inspiration from As You Like It play by William Shakespeare. Michael categorized our lives into front, back, and off stages. The front stage is where you do the work you're paid for. It's the professional part of you that the world sees. If you're a coach, for example, your front stage work is client meetings and drafting content. Then there's the backstage work. This is where you do the groundwork that prepares you for the front stage. Using the coaching examples, this could be billing or updating your website. Finally, there is the off stage. This is your rejuvenating time, the time you spend relaxing, connecting with, friend with friends and family, or playing. Determine the activities that fit into your front, back, and off stages. Then, plan your ideal week to mega-batch them accordingly. Conclusion 
The concept of productivity was made popular by industrial age efficiency experts like Frederick Winslow Taylor. The experts of that age advised companies to increase efficiency by making workers do more work faster. It worked for factory workers then because when you work faster in a factory, you naturally produce more products. But the concept is ineffective in our knowledge economy. If you're a knowledge worker, your job is not about directly working with machines to produce things. Your job mostly involves solving problems and coming up with new ideas. The problem is that problems and ideas don't run out. When you solve one problem, a different one emerges. You can be having dinner with family and an idea for a project you're working on pops into your mind. So if you follow the efficiency metric from the industrial age, you will never stop working. Productivity in our economy is not about getting more things done faster. It's about focusing on the right things and getting them done at the right time, then cutting out other tasks that don't fit into your ideal work. It's about working in your desire zone, where your passion and proficiency are at their peak, while delegating the tasks outside this zone to people who are good at and passionate about them. Whenever you feel overwhelmed and unproductive, recall the three-step system. Stop, cut, and act. Stop to, stop to think about your work and chart a course of action. Then, cut out unnecessary tasks and take action. We've discussed several points under the three-step system in this summary. Hopefully, you've learned actionable insights that will help you make the most of your personal and professional life. Try this. Make megabatching a weekly habit. Think of all the weekly activities you're certain to always perform. Group similar ones together, then create time to execute each group at specific stretches.